Hi everyone, it's Hail Heidi again. Today we are reacting to Six Lies America Told Me About Europe, Life in the UK. This is by International Carl. International Carl. Um, uh, please pardon me if I like have to wipe away tears from my eyes throughout this video. I just got done researching a little bit about how, yes, there is gun and ammo sold in some pharmacies in the US. That is apparently a thing and I hate it. It's mostly like in Southern states, it looks like, as far as I can tell so far. Very interesting. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about in this video. Um, let's go ahead and, um, and get into this one. Let's do this. Hey, everybody, welcome back. I'm so sorry. Also, make sure to like and subscribe to the video if you enjoy this journey or the content that we're making on this channel. Um, also, come and say hi to me on Twitch. I'd love to meet you. Anyway, I'm so sorry, let's continue. International Carl doing another video for you. If this is your first time to my channel, please, right now, stop and hit the like button, consider subscribing, and as always, yes. hit me in the comment section because those that have subscribed to my channel know that I'm always active in the Go comment section. Now, this video, we're gonna talk about a couple lies that the United States pushes into us as Americans growing up. And let's talk about it right now. Let's get to it right now. Lie number one. This one is a funny one to me because in the United States, it's always, I don't care if you're a de Democrat, I don't care if you're a Republican, I don't care if you're independent, I don't care where you're at on the political spectrum. You're always going to have a politician telling you that they hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. That's right. They hate us for our freedoms. Can you believe that? As if nowhere else in the world has any freedoms. Like Europe. You know, in Europe they act like, you know, they act like if you come to Europe, there's just no freedoms. What freedoms do I not have here in Europe? Yeah, that's honestly, at least what I remember in school when I was very young, uh, that's why we left you know, Europe. That's why we left and we, and we um, you know, created the United States was for our freedoms. That's exactly what they tell us. <laughs> I cannot believe that that was our president of the United States, President Bush, saying that they hate us for our freedoms. That's very, that's very interesting. You know, as these are Western democracies with Western values and culture, that has been exported to the United States and it's become its own thing. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but freedom. Except bread. That we can say is better in Europe. <laughs> anyway. Exist here. I'm still trying to, I'm still scratching my head. What freedom do you have in America that I don't have here? Let's talk about freedom of speech, for example. In America, you have freedom of speech. In the UK, for example, you don't have freedom of speech what you do have is freedom of expression. Slight different tweak, but let's give you an example. In America, you can be as racist as you want to somebody. You can walk up to me, walk up to any black person and say the N-word all day long if you want. Where in the UK, you really couldn't do that because at some point you will cross a fine line of inciting racial hatred. So if you define your freedoms based on your ability to call somebody an N-word or call some uh, Asian American some type of offensive word, by all means, you can have that freedom. I don't need that freedom. Right. Do we really need that? Is that, <laughs> is that the freedom we want? Yeah, that's, that's fair. Hmm. But other people in America talk about it like freedom for guns. Ooh, guns, guns, guns. They want to take your guns. Well, let's see. Here in the UK, can you have guns? Yes. Can you have a rifle? Yes. Can you have a handgun? Yes. What does the Second Amendment say in the United States? It has to be, it's highly regulated. So what is it here in the UK? Guess what? It's highly regulated. There's lots of regulations around what type of gun, where you have to store that gun, where you have to keep the ammunition, what do you have to do for the maintenance of that gun? Highly regulated. So you still have the freedom to have a gun. So if you define your freedoms as being able to have as many guns as you want in America, okay, fine, no argument, but I think that's a lie that they sell that nobody here has any guns. Not true. Number two, 
Social housing is a bad thing. It's something that you're supposed to segregate from the rest of the population. So, for example, in America, especially in L.A. where I'm from or Southern California where I'm from, social housing, Section 8. Well, that's usually in a separate side of the city, not being seen. I don't even know where it's at because where I grew up was nothing but beautiful homes, single family homes, no social housing. Where here in the U.K., just in Europe in general, it's all sprinkled around you. For example, here in the UK, I live in a beautiful big house, beautiful executive style estate. I have a nice car, but guess what? On this estate and on several new estates, they all have social housing and they do things that are different in the United States or that they do here in the UK that they wouldn't do or they don't do in the United States. You could be on social housing, but guess what? You can partially own that house. So that way you can be on the track. So you can buy 10% in the home, 20% of the home, 50% of the home, and try to get all the way up to 100% of the home like me or you do. So that's a different strategy that they do so that social housing is good for everybody because that way the kids get to interact with all people from all social and religious economic backgrounds. And okay, just really quickly, I do have to say, I don't know much about the social housing thing, um, that's just a subject that I'm not familiar with, like, really at all. Judge me if you will, but, um, I've rented a lot. We do own a property now, but I'm just, I'm not familiar with this concept, so I don't have anything to compare it to. So we'll just listen to what he has to say, and then I'll do my research later. <laughs> and you as an adult get to work and meet and mingle with people from all different backgrounds. I think the neighborhoods are better for it. They're safer for it. Less crime, because guess what? If you're in an executive style estate, well, guess what? You want to keep your home value high. You want to keep it nice and looking new. And that's going to put pressure on the social housing to also keep their house nice, keep the estate looking nice and new and fresh. So I think that's a myth. I think that's something that should be revisited in the United States. Number three, in America, they teach you this, that somehow being a hard worker means coming in early, staying late, never taking a vacation, and definitely don't call in sick. That is like the biggest mistake you could ever make, faux pas you can make. I'll give you an example. When I was working for a large airframe manufacturer in the United States, I remember a friend of mine, we wanted to take two weeks off and go do something. Our managers looked at us like we were crazy because we wanted to have the audacity to take two weeks off. And mind you, we didn't have, we didn't take any days off prior to that. We just wanted to take two weeks off in a year so we could go do something. It's a lot here. That, that's too much here. They were like, no, reject it, slim that down to a week. And I'm thinking, isn't that my time off to relax, to recharge my battery so I can come back to work? No. Now, I think minds and hearts have changed a little bit in the United States back from when I started working back in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, I should say. But that was a faux pas. Well, here in the United Kingdom and here in Europe, for example, it's encouraged to take time off. You get 20, 25 plus days off in mostly all European countries. I think by law in, in the European Union, you have to have 20 days off. So it's encouraged to take time off because either you use it or you lose it. And for example, I think Sweden, if I can find the article, it's on the screen now. But if not, Sweden is actually doing a trial where they're reducing the work hours to six hours to see if it increases productivity. And that's six hours a day instead of eight, I'm assuming. <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong. Because employees, employers are seeing that the employees are more rested and more focused when they come back to work. Number four. Really quickly before he moves to the next subject, I that is so interesting. And I've been learning that more and more about European countries is that we, I feel like the idea of a hardworking person in the United States is an overworked person <laughs> or someone who doesn't know how to relax. Like, I feel like we glorify workaholics way too much over here. Um, 
especially employers, they they really love employees who just work, 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 work and never take any days off and things like that. I know that there are some employers, there are some companies that do encourage people to take time off, uh, things like that, paid vacations, stuff like that. And that is awesome. So not everyone is like that, but I do feel like very commonly it's it's like, yeah, people are overworked and it's insane. <laughs> America sells you this, that capitalism and consumerism go hand in glove. It's like this cycle. You have to work, to buy, to work again, to pay for what you buy, to buy some more stuff, to then work again and go down this continuous loop of working to live. And in Europe, one of the things that I find I think is a, is a beauty and a benefit of working and living in Europe is that there's more of a work-life balance. As I just talked about in point number three, is that you have time off to actually do stuff. And you don't just have this endless working to consume. Don't get me wrong. We go on vacation, so we're consuming what I would call, um, we are consuming experiences, but we, we are not, we don't live to work. We work to live. And that is a benefit of living in Europe. And I think that is great. And I think the U.S. sells a lie to its people by telling them that you have to work hard to then buy stuff and never do anything. Number five, <laughs> yeah. which kind of ties into the first one I said, but it really is on the Republican right side in America. They always preach, especially during the Obamacare era, 2012, was all about these death panels. They literally produced a video where they were throwing grandma off a cliff because of social medicine. Make no mistake about it. President Obama and the Democrats who supported Obamacare began throwing seniors off the cliff back. The evils of social medicine that you were gonna have to have <laughs> death panels if you got sick. I mean, how ridiculous of a lie that is. I mean, it's a bold-faced <laughs> lie. I've lived here 11, 12 years. I have yet to ever see a death panel. I have known some older people. I know some younger people. I know myself. You can walk into any hospital in any country in Europe and there's not a single death panel. What do you expect them to say? Oh, I'm sorry, you had a heart attack last year, Mr. Carl, but... Um, since you had one last year, we're not going to treat you for this heart attack because the panel has refused your care. I honestly, I don't think I've ever heard of that. Um, I don't think I've ever heard of that, that lie or that, that rumor. That's interesting. <laughs> Ew, no, thank you. On a side note, you kind of already have that in America. You just have it through the insurance companies because guess what they do? Decide not to cover you. They say... It's a pre-existing condition. I don't think you can do that anymore, but they'll say that or they'll find really quickly. They can raise your your payments every month or they can adjust your insurance plan if you have a pre-existing um, condition. You know, they, they ask you actually this week is me and my husband are looking for new insurance. It's that time of year or however often they do it where you can change your insurance coverage. Yes, it's in a window which is, I don't know if other people do that too, but um, I've been talking to different insurance companies, things like that, and they're asking, you know, do you have any medications or pre-existing conditions so that they can adjust the plan that they have for us that, that's available to us, the, the price, deductibles, things like that. Um, so it definitely still affects it, but maybe you're not allowed to choose whether to cover something as an insurance company for a pre-existing. I'm not sure how that works, but it still affects the, the industry. Find a way to deny coverage. They'll make it so high to cost to do it that you have to do it out of pocket. And guess what? Now you're bankrupt. So that loops right back to number one. How are you free if you have to live with the pressure of going bankrupt it, and not being able to pay your bills because guess what? You have the audacity to break your hip, get sick. I don't to live, to be a human. I <laughs> don't know. You pick it. So those are the five things that I think that the United States lies or misleads its people on purpose to further whatever big business or whatever 
political agenda that they have to the people. I'm going to leave with a bonus one, which is do we need more? Kind of strange if you look at it, because number six is this. In America, every day, all students around the nation get up every morning and say the Pledge of Allegiance. You pledge yourself and align yourself to the United States flag and to the republic for which it stands. Now, that's not something that's common in Europe, in many Western countries. I don't know of any other Western country that makes its kids get up every morning. I do know of one back in 1938, 1942-ish time, those kids used to get up and actually pledge allegiance to their flag and to their Fuhrer. But I don't know Which one if was that's that? something we <laughs> should necessarily be doing. Don't get me wrong, I love my country. I'm very patriotic about it. I love the 4th of July for all its, my country is never perfect, but I think it can get better. No country is ever perfect. All countries could get better in certain ways. But anyway. <laughs> that's mine. Hit me in the comments. Tell me what you think. And like always, click here to subscribe to the channel. <laughs> and click yes. right here. Go support right this man. He's awesome. watch another one of my videos. International Carl. We like him. Um, that is interesting. It's funny that he put the Pledge of Allegiance in there. I know we've talked about that before. That's actually one that I've I've... My family, they're, they're starting to watch my YouTube videos. Hi, family. <laughs> and uh, that, that's a conversation that we've had or we've started to have about the Pledge of Allegiance um, as well. Very interesting, just all the different opinions. And um, I definitely, I, I thought that it's uh, kind of weird for a long time. And so it's nice to be able to hear other people saying that. <laughs> it's not just me. Um, so that's something that is just like resonating with me super hard. Um, but... <sighs> As always, thank you so much for watching today. Um, there are definitely some things that I learned in here that I, I need to research as well. That's what happens in every video. That's something that I love about reacting to this kind of content. I love just learning more about how things work in and out of the US, um, just ideas that people are having. It's, it's fascinating. So um, definitely keep putting your comments down below and then um, I will, yeah, I'll see you in the next video. <laughs> Bye guys.